Okay, hello, welcome to um, this webinar for Maryland Online. Um, it's called Creating Min uh, Meaningful Alternative Text, and it's presented by Debbie Dorsey. Debbie Dorsey is an assistant professor of health at Harvard Community College. Debbie is a Maryland Distance Learning Association board member, a Quality Matters peer reviewer, and a 2020 NISOD Excellence Award recipient. So now we'll turn it over to Debbie. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of moving around here so that I can show my screen. And I always will ask you, if you don't see it, give me a holler. So everyone is able to see, correct? Yes. We're good. You can see the screen creating meaningful text. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So um, thank you all for coming out and uh, for the webinar. What we're going to go over today is creating meaningful alternative text. And so um, I have to stop looking over this. I have two screens. So I've got my, my slides and then I've got my uh, window of everyone. And I'm actually going to turn my camera off so we can just really focus on um, the, the slides as we go along. Uh, as you have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. And uh, I'm the kind of person that will stop and then answer questions as we go along. So don't feel like you have to wait until the very end of the presentation to ask a question. So I'm gonna stop my video here and we'll go over our um, slides. And they're going to be um, pretty quick. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on review, but it's always a good idea to sort of have everybody be on the same page. So I love the definition <laughs> that's given for alt text textual substitute for non-text content. And so that is the technical term. And basically what we're saying is describe an image. Now, I'm going to give a disclaimer here. Uh, there is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, otherwise known as WCAG. And those were designed for all websites. So commercial, organizations, and they come at alternative text. There's a very key thing. They say, keep it brief. However, I would like to have an educator describe these two pictures in one sentence. And so, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, was there a question? All right, never mind. Um, and so the other part about this is context. So this is Abraham Lincoln. And I learned, I did not know this, I was presenting, and I did not know that this actually is an incorrect picture, that it's often um, claimed to be the Gettysburg Address, and it's not. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, that, that right there, we would have to have specific alt text. But again, it would depend on its context. Am I American history or I am or am I an art history? So again, there's two things that we want to look at. One is that it is likely okay in an educational setting to provide more than one sentence when you create alternative text. Also, we need to keep in mind our context. So with that in mind, we're going to acknowledge alternative text is challenging. When I look at this image, I sort of have flashbacks to chemistry and uh, looked at it and said, oh, at some point I did know what this means. But it's difficult. And it's difficult um, and not to single out this uh, particular subject matter. But I think the STEM uh faculty have a little bit more of a challenging time with this unless you know maybe they don't feel like they do but when i look at this i think that it's sometimes difficult to truly explain what this is and so the question becomes you know why do we need alt text and a lot of people ask well if there's text around an image why do we need to provide a description of the image why do we need this and so the question that I always pose to uh, those people that ask that is, why do we have alternative text? I'm sorry, why do we have images in the first place? So if we look at these two pictures side by side, we know, okay, this is the first one is just text-based and the other one has an image. And the reason why we provide images is to provide an alternative way of looking at content, right? That always goes back to our, um, excuse me, universal design, that we want to have multiple means of expression. And so the purpose of, of an image 
is to offer that, is to give the learner, the student, an alternative way of looking at text-based uh, information. And so the question also becomes, you know, why can't I just use the images caption? Why can't I take the images caption and paste it directly into alt text? And the reason why is that an image should have sufficient alternative text that the learner does not have to rely on either the text around it or the caption to understand the image's purpose. And, and this is the tricky part, the alt text should not be redundant to the same information that's the text near the image. And I think that will make it better, that'll sort of become better, clear, or more clear, better understanding once we really get into this. Okay, so there are, uh, Microsoft has, has thought that they've done their due, their due diligence in creating a sort of auto-generated auto alt text, but it's not good. So you can see here when I put this image into PowerPoint, it said a diagram of a, chem of a chemical structure. Well, yeah, that's a given, right? Doesn't really, that is not good alternative text. And so one of the things that I'm going to, well, a couple things that I'm going to go over with you, I want to make sure that everybody understands that what I'm talking about is self-authored content. So these are images that you are putting into some sort of digital uh, content, be it, uh, you know, a PowerPoint or a Word document or directly into your LMS. The, this is what we're talking about here, not necessarily going in to determine whether an external source like a website has good alternative text. So, I know that everybody probably present here may have different LMSs that they work on. And so you will get a copy of this particular slideshow in Adobe or I should say PDF format. And so you will be able to get these particular resources. I put them in there for Word. That's Microsoft is a lot of what we use to produce content. And then there's also Blackboard, Canvas, and Brightspace. But I, I sort of don't want to get into that super technical side of it, of how do I find an image and insert my alt text into it, because these are pretty good resources. If you're unfamiliar with how to do that, this will take you through it. What I also need to acknowledge is uh, what I call the elephant in the room, which is AI. And we do have resources. They sort of get better every day. There are resources that you can use that sort of give you this alternative text. And a lot of times it's, it's a jump off point, but they are expensive. You're never going to get, excuse me, you're never going to get AI, the free version, at least not now that can give you alternative text. You do have to pay for it. And I am a lowly professor, so I have never used the paid versions of AI. I've just always heard from you know secondhand sources that they are fairly good, but we're not going to talk about them necessarily today. What the first resource that I'm gonna go over is called um, the Image Alt Text Viewer. It's a plugin for Chrome. And there is again, the link to this. It's good, but there are some limitations. For one, you cannot copy and paste the alternative text into a Word document. You basically have to take it and rewrite it yourself. Also, this is alternative text that is created by someone else. So if you are going to take an image from a website and it does have alternative text on the image, Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. I always encourage you to think about this as a jump off point that you can take that information and then shape it into the context of what you're teaching. So here is an example. We go back to that first image and this is what the plugin, when I uh, used it, told me about this particular image. And notice, right, that it's pretty lengthy. So if I was in a website, you know, what WCAG would say is this is too much alternative text, but we need for it to be clearly descriptive. And what I'm hoping you notice with this is that it is describing the colors of different things. Um, it's assigning ATP to blue. In this particular case, 
imagine that you were visually impaired and you could not see this particular image. And we're also going to imagine that we do have text around the image that explains what this process is. And we might even have a caption, but we probably don't have a visually descriptive text anywhere. And that's where we can place it into this particular image. And yes, I did write this out from the plugin and this kind of what it looks like. So one of the things that I will encourage you to do is to think about OER sources. Lumen Learning is one that I often utilize because I find that they do a fairly good job at describing images. Their, their alt text is pretty good. And so I did a Google search of Lumen Learning chemistry and I found the site and then I used the image alt viewer and this is what I found. And again, um, I have the links up here for you. See how, again, that this is different. The alt text is different than the, the caption underneath of the image. It is a little bit more descriptive. And so if I close my eyes and I think about it and I put it in context with what I've heard in the figure and likely the surrounding text, it's going to give me a little bit more of the ability to visualize what these images are, are showing. And when we collect, when we put those things together, descriptive language of the images, the alt text that explains the, the text stuff, right? What you want to know about this topic, then a person who is visually impaired is getting what they need in order to understand the purpose of this image and what it means, what, what kind of content is being communicated. So I did another one. It was, again, using Lumen Learning Art History and the uh, alt text viewer. And I found this, it's the bo the boxer excavated. And I, I kind of wanted to give a variety of different subjects so that you could sort of see like, what are the differences? And again, it provided more detail. So if I just looked at figure one, the boxer excavated, and if that was all I knew about this image, it really doesn't convey the full uh, imagery, right? Of what this is saying. And you can see that the alt text did. It gave more information. If we think about what kind of text was probably around this image, it may not have been this detailed. It may not have said, here's what it would look like. There's a statue sitting on a mound of dirt, right? The text doesn't always convey that. And so here, the alt text image that did, it did give me some fairly good uh, alternative, alternative text. But here is also the good thing. Let's say, I mean, this this all text is not an end all be all description of this particular image. And so when I tell you that it's a jump off point, you may decide that in this this alt text, you want to add additional information. And what I what is important, I think that this is one of the things that we need as as educators to really understand is that if we are going to assess a student's understanding of subject matter and of images, then we need to provide them with the information so that they can successfully pass that assessment. And oftentimes I have faculty come to me and they say, well, then aren't I, aren't I just giving away the answers? And my response to that is, okay, if you think about yourself in a face-to-face -face setting, would you be speaking that information in your classroom? And so would you be giving the answers away there as well if you were talking about it? So it's really, you know, we need to think about the entire purpose of what alternative text is. And again, to really think about why are we giving this image to the student? Are we going to expect for them to fully understand it in order for them to be successful in passing whatever assessment we may use it in? So. There are times where you can get some fairly decent alternative text from a publisher. I teach health and exercise science and physical education. We often use Cengage and I've been sort of happy, right? Cengage didn't start off doing a, a great job with their alternative text, but they've really come a long way. And so this comes from my stress management course. And you can see that the it says detail. So if I was looking at this in an ebook, 
um, I would have to open up that drop down details and it gives all of this information. And so here's the thing that I need for you to understand. This is an image. And so if I am hearing impaired, my screen, I'm sorry, a visually impaired, my, this, this is text in an image. My screen reader is probably not going to read this text because it is an image of text. And so for that reason, the alternative text provides that information in uh, below the image. And by the way, this can be copy and paste it, but don't tell uh, Cengage that I said so. Okay, so one of the questions that I often get, and I feel for math faculty, because this is difficult, is, you know, how do I do this with, how do I place this in the context of equations? And so, like I said, I teach health and, and exercise science, so I am in by no means an expert in math, but I always like to help you find resources that can explain the process. And so uh, this is an example. And on the side there, you can see the Penn State has, they have a really good uh, sort of guidance to it. And then I found one that was for Canvas. And the reason why I put Canvas up is relative to our other LMSs, Blackboard and Brightspace. Canvas is, a little bit closer to being able to make math equations accessible. It's not perfect, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. And hopefully Blackboard and Brightspace will sort of follow suit. But if you're math faculty or you work with math faculty and you want to understand that better and you're using Canvas, there is this particular um, uh, guidance for how to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to go over the super low tech version to AI. And this is an app that I really like. One of the reasons that I like it is that if I speak into the app, it will convert fairly accurately my uh, my words, my spoken words into text. And it usually comes out as a text file. And then I can take that text file, download it, uh, I never realized how much I said the word um and you know when I'm trying to describe an image, but I can take all of that out and then I sort of can understand, okay, well, if I was standing in a classroom and I was explaining an image, this is what I would say about it. And so it helps for us to, let me come back there, this sort of helps for us to be succinct about what we will put in our alternative text. And the other thing, and, and this, this is sort of my philosophy, is that when we go into our content and we look at making it accessible, it sort of begs the question of, do I really need this image? Or is this image the, what I think is really needed for my subject matter? So it's almost kind of way of self auditing that there have been times that I've gone into an image and I've used uh, just press record and I've spoken about it. And as I'm talking about it in my mind, I'm thinking, this is not a great image. And then I go in and I find something that is a little bit more what I'm trying to convey to the learner. And so the other thing, when we're almost done, like I said, we wanted to make this pretty quick and have time open for questions. But one of the things you got to remember not to do is start with image of. So a screen reader already does this for the learner. And so going back to our friend here, Abraham Lincoln, if I put in picture of, it sounds like Graphic, graphic image of, image of, because as the screen reader gets to that point, it tells the learner, okay, right now we are on an image. So it's redundant. You do not need to put that in when you're creating alternative text for images. Okay, here is my contact information. I always uh, welcome questions. What I will tell people is, um, if I don't know the answer to your question, I can usually find somebody who does and can help you make that connection with that person. So I see that we do have some questions in the chat, I believe, and I, I can open it up for those now. There's There were just some welcome messages at the start, um, but okay. anyone can add anything now. Okay, so, so ask me questions. Does anyone have questions about what I covered today? <clears throat> I know I'm very thorough. <laughs> Any questions at all? 
Debbie, can you talk about when it's appropriate to have an image? They have the option to say like decorative image only. Like when is that appropriate to use? Ah, that is a very good question. Yes. Um, So that, sorry, the time, I didn't mean to cough into the mic here. So the time that you want to put decorative is if you, exactly that. If you're putting it into something and they, you know, if they don't understand what it is, it's not going to negatively impact their understanding of the subject matter. So we have, um, and I'm, she, she would not be happy with me. I don't know if I if I bring her up, but we have faculty who loves uh, cats. And so she will put cats into different places in her content. But she's pretty clear that it's a cat. It's it's not supposed to be, you know, connected in any way to the learning material. It's just decorative. Um, another place where you might put that is if, and, I, and we actually don't recommend that you do this. So I'll start off by saying we really do not recommend that you ever use text as a picture. But if you did, and it wasn't text that you felt they needed to know, it was just there to be pretty, then that would also be uh, used for decoration, for decorative purposes. Good question. Other questions at all? Okay, so we do have, Maryland Online does have a, YouTube, <clears throat> excuse me, a YouTube playlist that goes over a couple of other really quick um, accessibility tips. And we will be going through the a next series that covers those topics in greater depth. But I think uh, Marjorie put into, yes, put into the, the chat, the link to that playlist. So please take a look at it. Uh, the, it sort of can serve as a bit of a, okay, an understanding of this is what the the next webinar that we have on this topic, here's where we're going with it. Those videos do spend a certain amount of time helping you to understand why certain uh, points of accessibility are important. And if they're not there, what it sounds like on the opposite end of what you're creating, meaning the learner or the student. Deb, I also want to just kind of put in a plug for that. Those videos are only a couple of minutes long each. They're they're very short and they're very specific. So I encourage anyone who, you know, if you, you're you're trying to make your online courses more accessible and you just have a quick question. If you go to that playlist, you may find something it's they're good, they're clear, and then you can kind of, you know, learn something in a couple of minutes and apply it right away. Um, so we do encourage those and we will be hearing more information because we're going to go ahead and send some stuff out uh, later. Um, and we can include the link. We'll try to remember to include the link uh, in the when you guys all get the recording and the, the slides. And I, I see Nina, who is my colleague, <laughs> has a question. Can I put my sense of humor into alt text without losing the accessibility? Absolutely. Now, there are people who would disagree excuse me, with me that if you put your sense of humor into that, is it that you're detracting from the student being able to understand what you're truly being able to convey? So there's a difference. What what I would say is perhaps there is a difference between uh, humor and commentary. In general, we want to avoid commentary on a particular image just so that we don't sort of lead you know, or, or you know, it, it, it should be a little bit more factual, but I do believe that, and, and we always just use our best judgment on this, that, you know, if you do in, in put in a little bit of humor about it, just make it so that it's very clear that you're being funny and not that you're trying to lead or um, yeah, lead a person to look at the image in a very specific way. Good question. Okay. So like I said, this is my contact information. And if you do have any questions, please reach out. I I believe we have another slide to present. Um, And so, oh, do I have a chat? Oh, (laughs) yes, you do have a sparkling personality, Nina. That is true. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so that the last slide can be shared. 
And so I'm not sure if Marjorie or, um, there we go. Okay, this is a slide you can use if you need proof of um, attendance. You can copy this. I also want to put in a plug for our next webinar, which is on March 5th. Um, that's a Tuesday at 2 p.m. We have Dr. Tanya Meads and Dr. Adam King from University of Illinois talking about generative AI in education. And that'll be moderated by Mike Mills from Montgomery College. So please um, take a look at that. And I'm also going to put in the chat the link to our full uh, webinar schedule. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Debbie. You're welcome. <laughs> Debbie, can I tell you a quick story that's relevant? Certainly. I love stories. Um, I can pop my camera on. 